View from the Gutters, episode 43. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Kingdom Come, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 112.53. Uh, what episode is this? 43? It's 8012. Yes, it's right. 43. Welcome to View from the Gutters, episode 8012. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Joe. <laughs> episode 43. Uh, yeah, we're talking about Kingdom Come, and I'm Andrew Chard. I am Joe Pretty. Eric Mannix. I'm Tobias Panchin. And I'm Cade Reynolds. All right. And we're uh, talking about Kingdom Come. Finally. We pitch this book a lot of times on the we, show. We yeah, have, it yeah. takes us a while, but we get it done. Well, we knew that we would have to talk about it eventually. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that was always on the agenda. Yeah, it's one of those books that is, it's just kind of, you need to read it if you're a big comics fan, especially if you're a DC fan. But, you know, if you like superhero comics uh, at all, it's kind of a must read, I think. Part of me wants to say that it's obligatory, but I think I'm going to go with fundamental. That's good. That's the word I was looking for. I would say it's both of those things. I I would say that if you're into superhero comics, at some point, you need to read Kingdom Come. Also, someone's going to put it in your hands, too. Yeah, I I, agree. Also, I don't like the new printing of it. Yeah, I was actually very green. Uh, I don't like it either. It looks like a Green Lantern book. It yeah, does. Joe Chard and I all have the same edition, which oh, is, I think, is, the second most one. recent, and you have the most recent edition. Yeah, it's which great. is I have not as good. If you look cover. at the binder on it, yeah, the very it's got first Green Lantern. Is Green Lantern. It's got this, who is my favorite redesign in this book? Is Green Lantern's redesign? Um, yeah, it's actually pretty good. I love his fucking sword. Yeah, it's so cool, and he looks like Parallax, but he, does. he, he has like. I mean the old old parallax. Well, he's got the domino mask. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. It's cool. Um, okay. well, we don't well, acknowledge new parallax. The yellow guy. I mean, I guess we can. Uh, I was like, that was a while ago. It was. I'm sure, we're it not was. ignoring that. What's the checklist of things I ignore and don't ignore, Joe? If it's new, 52, you have to email it to it. me because I, I forget. It's, There's a lot of stuff that it, you ignore. It, it, it the changes. Ultimate Universe, New Fifty Two. I'm not ignoring. I'm not no, ignoring no, the. Okay. I'm saying that mm-hmm. you can't. Mm-hmm. Anyways, mm-hmm. all right. Uh, Toby, you pitched this, right? Yes, I did. Do you want to talk about it first? Uh, yeah. I mean, God, there's there's so much to say because I mean, it's an incredibly dense comic. I mean, it's yeah. very, it's very, it's every inch the equal of Earth X, oh, which yeah. we talked about previously. And honestly, like, I think there's even more going on here than there was in Earth X because it's. Try, kind of trying to show the future of mm-hmm. DC Comics, but at the same time, it's also trying to explain the past of DC Comics, and it's also sort of refuting the present of DC Comics at the time, which was the mid-90s. Right. Which is really weird, because normally you would expect something like this to have come out in, like, 2002 or 2003, yeah. and kind of been a, this is what was going on at the time, and this is why it was fucked up. Mm-hmm. And instead, it happened like right in the middle of it. Like yeah. this was happening at the same time as like onslaught. I want to say, yeah, uh, like yeah, 90, 90, 96, 97. Yeah, that's what made me quit comics was onslaught. Actually. Yeah, and so it's so weird for this something <laughs> which is such terrible. a scathing <laughs> critique of the nineties to oh, come yeah. out right in the middle of that. I mean, Authority, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago had not even come out when this was released. Right. That was not till 2000, what? I think it was. No, no, it was 90, 98. 98. Was it right. 98? Yeah. Yeah. So, which is when I always think this book came out, but yeah. it's always, I'm always surprised that this came out earlier than I think Yeah, I always think did. it's 98 too for some reason. I don't know. I, it just seems a little bit I don't know. I, yeah, I, tell, I agree with Toby, and I think that one thing that's really different about this than uh, EarthX was EarthX is explaining the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Like, right. very strictly. And I feel like this is more meta, where it's not just uh, explaining the DC Universe. Well, it's not explaining the DC no. Universe, but it's explaining the metaphysics of the U- DC right. Universe, like why it is um, important on a philosophical level. Right. And I also think just 
you can extrapolate this to not just DC Comics, but to all of superhero comics at that time. Well, this where is, yeah, this Earth is... X was very like we're going to explain why the Marvel Universe works the way that it does, right? Like to set itself apart from DC and Image. Like I feel like uh, Earth X did a lot into defining Marvel Comics at the time. And a lot of writers now have picked up those threads and even for the last 10 years have like run with those ideas. And so it did more to shape the Marvel Universe than this did to shape the DC Universe. Because it, yeah. was, it was DC was already really established at that point. Like it well, had a flow I, going yeah. on. I don't and, think he's he's not trying to. Uh, and uh, I think I want to say that Grant Morrison in A Midsummer's Nightmare cites Kingdom Come and talks about. Uh, this being a really important work because um, this is all about criticism. Yeah. Like this is a critical work and the, what it's critical of is everything that's going on in comics in the nineties. You have image, which has sacrificed any kind of like idea of story for, you know, big tits and big guns and ultra violence. You have a lot of the more dark stuff going on at DC mm-hmm. And this is Mark Wade going, this is not what comics are about. This is not what we're about. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's really encapsulating the 90s through the character of Magog, mm-hmm. who is very clearly an analog of Cable. Right. I mean, just his design yeah. screams yeah. Cable in every dimension. And he's basically going, this is what comes of this. Like, this right. is what will happen in the future of a universe where these sort of people are our heroes, quote unquote, and this is why that's wrong. This is, and this is how you stand against it. Yeah, you know, this is basically his counterpoint to everything that the '90s was trying to say on a critical level. Yeah, Kate, do you, you look like you wanted to add something to that? No. Uh, no, just, I don't think so. You just making uh, making bedroom eyes at me. Is that what was going on? I missed something. No, I was going to look for your cover because I didn't realize that my cover had Jade on it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mine's, mine's and, well, it's the same one. Yeah. 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 And no. she's an awesome character, and I didn't know if your Green Lantern looking one had oh, Jade on it. I don't think it. it has anybody. No. It's just got like Superman. And, it doesn't and, matter because uh, Jade doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so that's, yeah, see, that's which, what we're ignoring. Which actually yeah. the fact that takes me to another like point. Mm-hmm. But may, I mean, maybe you guys want to talk about your initial impressions yeah, a little bit more you, first. But the, the thing that I came to reading this is this is everything that DC was doing right until the new 52 reboot, which kind of did a 180 and now they're doing everything wrong. Well, there's, and I, I brought this up to, uh, to Toby earlier. There's in the very beginning, uh, wonder woman comes to see Superman and she's talking to him and she says, at one point she says, Cal, our generation has always taken its cue from you. Uh, basically telling him that th- they need him to lead. He needs to be the figurehead. Right. And I find this very interesting because in this new iteration of the DCU, they've turned Superman into an asshole. And they've turned everybody else into angsty, awful, very shallow characters. And you can't have this Superman. You can't have that iconic idea of Superman exists in that universe because it doesn't work. And that's, I yeah, think, well, the really interesting parallel. And if you want to go to a darker universe like that, the one person that always feels out of place in those books is Superman. And they always have to do something in those universes to subvert him. Like in The Dark Knight Returns, they make him like an agent of the government. Right. And they make him a very corrupt figure. Well, and even then, Miller admitted that he wrote him out of character. Well, that's my, I mean, still that's, my biggest absolutely. problem with that book. Because even well, then, he's, that's Superman that, not done that's, right. That's what you have to do, though, I think. Yeah, like, he doesn't. I agree with yeah. Joe. Like, he doesn't fit into a universe like that. Yeah. And it, to do... <laughs> well, there's there's a very diff, there's a very precise balance that he, that you need when it comes to Superman because he is so powerful. And people complain about, like, oh, he's a boring character, he's not realistic, all of these things, because of his power. The power of Superman, it's almost like a a setting element, if Superman were a setting. Mm -hmm. What Superman is really about is his humanity and the burden of power and how he strives to better the world when he could so easily destroy it. And when you darken Superman, 
When you darken the universe that he exists in, you throw that out of balance. And the question very quickly becomes, well, why doesn't Superman just kill all of the bad people? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And that's why Kingdom Come is so important because it's saying, like, this is why Superman doesn't go down this path. This is what happens when Superman goes just a little bit dark. Well, yeah. And at the end, like, you get the feeling that everything, the tables have turned and now Superman is like a borderline becoming God villain rather than like the savior when he's at the UN and he's basically just tearing the ceiling down before, uh, what's the guy's name? The old, the old guy, Norman, uh, Norman. McCray. before Norman okay. starts to talk yeah. to him, like his eyes are okay. red. They're the, like the x-ray eyes. The and you vision, see, it's yeah. like in a different circumstance, Superman could very easily cross the line and be, you know, a god slash villain character where he's like, look, if you do anything I disagree with, I'm going to kill you. Oh, and absolutely. I think the scene in this book that hits me the hardest is when Superman goes to visit um, uh, Apocalypse and he talks to Orion, Orion, Orion. who and the, it's so brilliant. The art panels in those first two panels are so oh, brilliant really because it's silhouetted and you're yeah. like, you oh, he went to go see Darkseid. Yeah. And then it's his son who was one of the new gods, who was a hero, who was someone who fought against the corruption and apocalypse because he was raised there, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that. and he, they overthrow apocalypse and the people vote in a new leader and they vote Orion and he just basically like is forced to kind of continue his. Yeah. I mean, his he says, dark um, reign. our story has always been a generational one. Yeah. Which and is why I say Superman this is a cap- Yeah. It's encapsulating what mm-hmm. the DC universe is about. Yeah. Because, I mean, for many, many years, they, like, specifically uh, positioned themselves as the legacy universe. Yeah. That, you know, you had the heroes of the past, yeah. the JSA, you had the heroes of the future, the Legion of Superheroes, yeah. and then you had the current generation that was kind of in the middle, and they were very clear, like, this is just a single moment in history, and things happened before this and they're going to continue after this, and it's about well, it's what I've you know the character about. Yeah. about passing on the mantles, about making the world a better place. It's what I talk about when we talk about the Flash and the passing of the mantle on. Absolutely, you know, like those moments are so powerful in Crisis on Infinite Earths because it's like, look, this was his protege. Now it's his turn to be the hero that he, you know, was once the sidekick to. You know, like that passing on of the mantle is so important for the DCU. It's something that I find the most compelling about the universe. It's something that's so different from Marvel, where the Marvel characters, Iron Man is still Iron Man. There is not a replacement for Iron Man. And Captain America, although there have been replacement Captain America... Well, there's been a replacement Iron Man, too, but but it's always been about that character. Yeah, and you always get the feeling, while that character is in their place, that it is not permanent. Mm -hmm. Like, Right away, everyone in the Mar when Bucky became Captain of Spoilers of ten years. Yeah, when that happened, yeah. you knew uh, he was coming back. Uh, you just like automatically, everybody was like really hesitant. They're like, "Well, when is Cap coming? Like, when is Steve coming back? Because we know he's coming back. Like, we already know. Like, there's so much doubt in the Marvel universe. Or in the DC universe, when somebody takes on the mantle, even when it was Batman, people were like, "Is he coming back? Like, maybe not because." Yeah. We, if there hadn't been movies coming out around that time, I think we would have seen Dick Grayson's Batman for longer. And I would have liked that. It I, was really interesting. Like I said, one of, the, one of the biggest problems that I have with the New 52 universe is, you know, what did they do? The Flash is Barry Allen. Batgirl oh, is Barbara Gordon. Um, they undid all that stuff. It's, yeah, back yeah, to the like, Silver Age revival. Bruce like, Wayne is Batman again. Like, everyone is who they were in the Silver Age. In name only, not in their actual personalities or the right, heroic elements it's, that it's they used to have. undoing but, yeah. all the work that they built over the last three decades. Absolutely. Creating a universe that has legacies. That feels like it's a real place with traditions and people passing on the torch and building something and create, you know, the Flash is... You know, created this legacy. Like, there was a Flash then, there is a Flash now, there will be a Flash in the future. Yeah. And they just completely just shat all over that. And they're like, no, there's only ever been the one Flash now. Well, and the, so, the Bat family... Oh, sorry, Kate, to cut you off. Um, I'm going to elaborate on this a little, because this was one of my favorite parts about uh, near the end of Smallville. I know a lot of people hate that show. I love it. I, I'm all right. ostracized for it. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. It's, um. <laughs> 
But th- when they introduced the JSA and Star- they had Stargirl on there after Starman was murdered on the show, and she's teaching Clark a lesson about the way the JSA did it and how it's familial. There's, you know, there's so many uh, the deep relationships, you know, the old heroes of the mantle uh, with the new heroes of the mantle being a family. Yeah. And in the new JSA, the stuff that Jeff Johns worked on, like it was all about, there was a mix of old and new heroes, which isn't the way that it always used to be. But I thought that was really smart. Because it was my favorite have, team book that DC did. Yeah. You have yeah. the old heroes basically training young heroes. And something I've always loved about the DCU is like the young heroes are so compelling because they don't have to be heroes. And something else that I thought was really interesting about this is they're vague on the identity of some of these characters, like oh, yeah. the Flash and the Green Lantern. And it really feels like all of those JLA characters who come back mm-hmm. at the beginning of this story are more of the Golden Age yeah. versions of themselves. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Flash has Jay Garrick's helmet. Right. And we were arguing about who the Green Lantern was in this because he's never named I thought he was Hal Jordan, yeah. but I'm actually looking at the big crowd shots that are at the end of the volume, uh-huh. and it says, for the because it has descriptions of like who right. all the characters are, it says for the Green Lantern, merging his lantern into himself, he is the most powerful champion of that name. And if you look very closely at his chest, the lantern on his chest is Alan Scott's lantern. Right, and it's also... Like the Superman has the JSA symbol Superman on his chest. Like this is these are the golden age, and I I agree. Like I'm they're like, golden age in character, mm-hmm. if not necessarily an identity. Well, well even look in, at Superman's costume. That's yeah. a golden age costume. That's yeah, Earth that's two what I'm style. Yeah, yeah two, Superman. Right. Group, and when yeah. they rebooted, they did you know new versions of the green. Not not now, but when they did the original Silver Age reboot of the characters, when they did, uh, they introduced Barry Allen Barry as the Flash first, and. Yeah. Uh, um, Hal Jordan. Hal is Jordan as the Green Lantern. They the way that they got around that was like Earth Two had pre the previous versions and these are new versions. But Superman and Wonder Woman, like where those where the Golden Age Superman ends and the Silver Age Superman begins, is sort of a blurry line that fans created later. Even then, yeah, there's no consensus. And it's so exactly when. the the characterization of these of Superman, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman because he didn't get rebooted either um, feel like. They're kind of an amalgamation of those characters, but I think I agree with you that I think that Green Lantern and yeah, I mean, the just Flash, the fact, they feel just the know, fact that Power Girl is there and Supergirl isn't right. Like That's this feels very much that it that it is invoking the identity of the Golden Age. Well, and I think that the biggest point of this comic, in a lot of respects, is that when the Golden Age heroes go away, when they decide that they're done, and the young when they've left the young heroes to their own devices, shit got out of control. And something that the DC universe has always had is the older heroes training younger heroes. Like Bruce Wayne has taken on many Robins and like, uh, is it Wildcat? The guy from the JSA is constantly training new heroes. And it's like, that's an important part of the universe. And when Superman quits, like they, like the line that Diana says that our generation is always taking the cue from Superman. He's the first one to quit. Everybody else quits. And when the Golden Age heroes go wow. away, they basically created all of these problems themselves. Like Superman, the, and this is my one point of contention with this book. The one thing that I can't believe about this book is I don't think Superman would ever quit. So I think the story falls apart. That's why I feel like it, it's an it has the trap story. That, it will has the trap that a lot of Superman stories um, had around this this era and even into the early 2000s where... If you wanted to hurt Superman, you hurt Lois. Like yeah. that's a, a trope they did to death, and it oh, started yeah. to drive me nuts. Uh, I like them together. I like them married. The whole I grew up on yeah. the Burn era, so New Fifty Two. I was not like a fan of Ugh. unmarrying them, and to the fact that they don't hardly even know each other, I'm not yeah. a fan of that. But I also understand, creatively speaking, why you would shy away from like we'll just shove Lois off a building and then Superman's other like look at Final yeah. Crisis one of yeah. the worst things I've ever read like they, they take Lois Lane out of the picture thereby taking Superman out of the picture for the entire book right. again he's so powerful he could easily have yeah. fixed everything himself and but you take Lois out I, my favorite thing is that it was kind of an accident that Lois dies in this book like it wasn't really a nefarious plot like it was the Joker, the Joker being, being the, the Joker, Joker yeah. and my favorite part is the anti-Superman weapon in this book is uh 
uh, Lex over Lex Luthor over years has been corrupting Billy Batson mm-hmm. into his like puppet, and yeah. that's so Lex Luthor. Like that's like such a yeah. brilliant move. And when you age the universe ahead like that in an Elseworlds story, you get really cool things happening. Oh, yeah, like yeah that. I mean, I think we've all read this story more than once before. Yeah, so at least three or four and times. Yeah. I don't really feel it anymore. But the first time reading this, the reveal that he has been Billy Batson the entire time. That is that was a really shocking reveal. Like oh, yeah. I thought that was really really cool the first time I read it cuz yeah. to- like I totally got fooled. Yeah, cuz you I just no imagine idea. that he's Shazam. I think that they could have done well more with that by leaving him in costume. But yeah. the reveal when he first shows up in the costume though is such a powerful moment in the book oh, that yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to sacrifice that. Well, I think he does that just image enough. is fucking fantastic. Ra- Ross does just enough to kind of give you this feeling that why is he familiar? You know, when he yeah. first comes up to the table when they're all oh, gathered yeah. there, you're like, Why is this guy so familiar? And then you get the reveal and you're like, Bah. Yeah, like it's this really incredibly powerful moment. Alex Ross uses models to draw well, characters, and he's been using the same models for certain characters for a long time. I know that the guy who models for uh, Shazam for him, I think, has been the same for like a really long time. So that that face structure that he has is like you can feel Shazam when you say, "Well, you know, it's Billy Batson or Shazam," like right away. Like even if well, you, Captain Marvel. Well, yeah, Captain Marvel. Yeah. He used to be called Shazam in the TV show. No, he's, well, no, well no, he's he was originally Captain Marvel, Marvel, right. then Marvel and then he they had to stop publishing right. him because DC sued Fawcett Comics right. because they felt like Captain Marvel was too close to Superman. Mm-hmm. And then Marvel Comics made their own Captain Marvel, got the trademark for it. Right. And so when DC bought Fawcett Comics, which had gone out of business or something. Yeah. Um, the book they was called were, Shazam. The book was called Shazam because they couldn't use the Captain Marvel name as a title because of trademarks. But I think in But the he was old, still called Captain right, Marvel yeah, up until, show, like, didn't they call him Shazam? very recently. I think in the old TV show, I thought they called him I might have called him Shazam. The show was called Shazam. I've never also. seen it. I don't know. I don't remember. But anyway, like, I think that those... The moments of the villains being villainous in this book are really, really powerful because it's, you know, these new superheroes don't really know how to do anything except run in and punch hard. And then that's such a commentary on 90s comics. Mm. It's like, you know, Wolverine solved problems by slashing at it with his claws. And if it was more complicated than that, then you needed someone like Scott Summers or Professor X to be like, oh, let's finesse this situation a little bit. Like, the 90s were all about the hero that just punches hard. And that's what Magog and... And actually, I forgot how little Magog is in this book. Yeah, I know. I've so so very very yeah. yeah, he's such a huge part of this book that I was like, oh yeah, Magog's in all of it. And he's in like yeah. the and, I mean, there's, there's also kind of the element of the golden calf mm-hmm. in there and worshipping false idols. Yeah. I mean, this really, really ties hard into the mythological aspects of the DC universe and the yeah. fact that the DC heroes have been like unto gods for so long. Right. And, the well, new, and going and talking to the new gods, which I totally forgot was in this book... And, like, getting Big Barda and... Uh, um, Scott Free. Mi- yeah, Mr. Miracle. Yeah. yeah. To help design the prison is, like... Ah, it's so good. But, oh, back to my point earlier about Superman quitting. The only other person that's really told, like, a good Superman quits story to me is the Alan Moore, whatever happened to the Man, Man of Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, but in yeah. that story, it's implied that he's, like, not really needed anymore. Yeah. Like, that, the, that he's kind of, like, done all the good he can do, and now he gets to go live... The life that he gets, yeah, to live. he gets his happily ever after, right? And that's the only way I ever imagined Superman giving up. Like his character to me is, he fights until <laughs> there is no answer. Like well, he, he doesn't dies. give up. That's the thing. He, yeah, he he completes his right. mission. He completes what or he's going to do. Everybody he, dies. Yeah, like it's one or the other, and that. And that it sort of worked in the death of Superman, but that book irritates me in a lot of ways. Well, I but uh, yeah, uh, no, this, again, it's very of the nineties. Yeah, this story to me, that's the major flaw in this because I'm glad that Superman comes back and like what he does at the end is so powerful. But it's hard for me to imagine a universe in which Superman something bad happens and he just gives up. Because it's not just Lois dying that makes him give up. It's the irradiation of Kansas and his parents dying. Right. Like, that's what really nails the Well, no, it's his parents dying. The irradiation of, of Kansas is, when, is what prompts Diana to go and look for him. 
that yeah, happens. It's, it's the trial of that's, Magog. Yeah, that, that Magog that is oh, that's right. the murder of the Joker and that he, makes him leave. That's he right. leaves and really, because I mean that is kind of I mean it's I, it's a metaphor. It's a criticism mm-hmm. of the '90s and audiences turning away from Superman, going for the more violent characters, kind of saying, "No, he's stupid. He's old well, fashioned." Well, and I think that's what makes of, this really work. Yeah. Is that they don't you can't break him physically, right? Right. They break his heart. Yeah, you have yeah. to attack. Like his when humanity. that happens, right. yeah, you you're hitting him at his most base level, and at that point he's like, "Well, well, I've sacrificed. Now I have sacrificed literally everything that I can sacrifice. Yeah, and you have clearly chosen this other thing. You've well, clearly they, chosen this other way. So this is not. And they, it's it's interesting because it's the people that break him. It's not yeah. the Joker because they show that pie chart that's like basically Magog's approval rating versus Superman's approval uh. rating. Not in not in so many words, but. Basically, it's like people who agree with the outcome of the trial versus people who disagree with it, and the people who agree with the outcome that Magog did the right thing is vastly superior than the people that think he did something wrong. Absolutely, and that's when Superman breaks. Yeah, and it's I still I still have a hard time believing that he would quit. But something that's so powerful about this book is you really I feel Magog's argument. Like I. It's hard for me to read Batman sometimes because the Joker I'm does such horrible really things and you're like, glad, why doesn't he just kill him? I'm really glad you brought this up because that we were talking about this a little bit before. My only problem with Kingdom Come and going back and, re- and reading this now mm-hmm. is that it's preachy. Yeah. You know, Mark Waite is definitely saying here that these are superheroes and they have to be iconic. And I'm kind of like, no, like that's bullshit. I love the authority. I think it's yeah. great. I love the idea that there is a power in the universe that's going to come in and be like, what you're doing is wrong. We've tried to talk to you about this, and clearly it hasn't taken. So now we're just going to well, wipe you off I the face of the earth. And I think that Wonder Woman is that counter argument yeah. within the book. Like she is like, yes, I can be iconic. And yes, like, I can be the coolest character in this book. And because well, I don't, I don't <laughs> no, like Wonder amazing. Woman, and she's such. And I was like, well, you're defending Wonder Woman. Yeah, like, I'm not a I'm Wonder shocked. Woman fan, but like she's written See, so well in this book. Absolutely. Her character is so well defined, where she's like, look, we are heroes. I'm she's here to get you out of retirement. To- get off your ass and be a leader. Oh, you're not going to be a leader? Well, then I'll fuck. Can do it, what is and the, she picks up the pace when like Superman she, can't handle it. She yeah. says, and she stabs uh, she that guy. They think they're warriors, and if they want yeah. a war, I will give them. Ah, oh, it's like, so good because yeah, she is a warrior, pretty, yeah. and that's when Wonder Woman is so perfectly characterized for me. Is like she crosses the line when it's necessary. It's like, look, I warned him. I said, don't come here or I'll stab you. That's and he what came I've over always here. loved about so Wonder Woman. She stabbed myself, yeah. him. It's not well, like she stabbed him unfairly, quote unquote. You know. Believe it or not, I actually want to quibble with Joe over this point. Oh, yeah, you fight with Joe. I'm going to go take a coffee break. The thing thing is that I don't think that Wade is making a universal statement about superheroes in general. I think he is making a statement specifically about the DC universe and the DC heroes. And I think it's possible to take elements of his message and apply them without necessarily taking the entire message. And I, I think that in part that is what Marvel has done in the last 10 years. And especially recently is that they kind of went through this dark period with Civil War Mm -hmm. and Dark Reign. And Civil War actually draws off of this a lot. Like really drawing off of this and that coming out of that with the Heroic Age relaunch and then the Marvel Now stuff Mm -hmm. is they've come out of that period and said, okay, we've cleaned the board and now it's time for heroes to be heroes again. Yeah. And they're still Marvel heroes. They're still human. They're still flawed. But it's about transcending those flaws and aspiring to be something bigger and better than what they are that's really made Marvel interesting currently. Yeah. Not anywhere else more so than in Avengers AI, which I think is an underappreciated book, where um, uh, Hank Pym is basically saying, yeah, I'm bipolar. Mm -hmm. And I'm a superhero. And I've been working to manage my episodes to make the lows as shallow as possible and do the most with the highs that I can and do. And that's exactly what Banner's doing in Incredible Hulk oh, yeah. with like I'm I'm going to work for Shield, Banner builds, Hulk destroys. Like that's it's such a good concept and in uh Captain Marvel which I just recently read the first two trades of. Uh Carol Danvers is like she is a hero. She's doing great heroic things and it's so refreshing in the Marvel universe to see someone punch something that isn't a Marvel villain. 
Like, she's punching giant robots. She's punching dinosaurs. Like, there's so much cool shit in that book. Oh, no, absolutely. Where she's like, look, I just got to save people. That's what I'm doing. Like, I'm going to be an iconic hero. And people look up to me now. And I think that's what Marvel... I agree with Toby that's doing that right. But Joe, I also agree that, like, there are times in which... That goes too far. Like, there's times in which I think that Batman should have killed the Joker. I, I, and I, in my readings of Joker, when we were talking about the killing joke and Grant Morrison had just said that, like, oh, this is Alan Moore killing the Joker, I can see why he would read that into it. Because there's definitely that moment is, like, when when do you let these people hurt you bad enough to where you have to get rid of them forever? And Superman's solution of locking them up in a giant prison... Uh, isn't just an allegory in this book. Like, that's literally what they do in the DC universe is just mm. put them in Arkham, put them in, uh, you know, some kind of prison and just hope for the best. And, like, well, that doesn't always work. And I think that that's why the the conflict between Wonder Woman and Superman in this book is so strong. I think my my problem with it is not so much... It's... I think my problem with it is that reading this, Mark Mark Wade loves Superman. And I think Mark Wade has a, a deep and and meaningful love for that character, and I can understand that. But you know, he was incredibly critical of Man of Steel when it came out, uh, regardless of the fact that Superman has had to kill Zod before, right? Spoiler if you haven't seen the movie already. I, I, yeah, I've read uh, uh, comic book from nineteen eighty eight. Yeah, but, and so <laughs> like the, the thing is, is this? I don't. Necess- I think he equates too heavily with this idea that like. While I understand why Superman left, I also think that Superman in the past has understood that sometimes this thing that should never have to be done needs to be done. And that was like the only good part of Sacrifice where... Wonder Woman has to kill Maxwell Lord because yeah. Maxwell Lord has taken over Superman. But Superman is he has- looks at her and he goes, I don't judge you for what you've done. I understand that you needed to do it, but people are going to judge you for it. Yeah. And they're not going to let you also, off easily for it. He can't stand behind her in that. Because the great thing about Superman is if he wanted everyone who was doing villainous things to be dead, he could do well, it. Yeah, they would like, there's cool. no one yeah. to stop Superman. I think that's why himself. he doesn't, because at he what can't point do you stop? the line. Well, that's exactly absolutely. what it is. It's like, yeah. if he takes one step across the line and is like, Lex Luthor should die, or the Joker should die, or any of these major villains should die, who's next? Because no one, there are so many villainous characters in the DCU, and what happens when all of those major villains are wiped away? There's another layer of villains, and another yeah. layer of villains. Because in the DCU, just like there are layers upon layers of legacy heroes, there are also layer upon layer of legacy villains. And Superman would just have to kill everyone. Yeah, and, and he saying, can yeah. never cross that line. The, the, I, well, read it redeemable if you want to read the book yeah. of Superman killing people, well, and yeah. that's Mark Wade. Yeah. So that's like, to me, like that's what I love about that book. It's, it's like. Clearly, that's Mark Wade, who loves Superman, doing like the ultimate Elseworld story. It, where yeah. it's obviously it's Boom Studios, it's a different thing, but it's clearly like Superman going oh, out yeah. and killing am, everyone and being. Am I misremembering, or did Mark Wade also write Empire? Yeah, uh, he, he did, did yeah. and he wrote uh, Birthright, I think. Right, he did, which is my favorite Superman story. Yeah, he, so, I mean, like, he's been, he's, he's basically, examined this issue yeah. from a lot of different angles mm-hmm. and yes. said different right. things no. yeah my problem is specific like he has examined it my i guess my problem with it is that it's always uh, feels like superman is his focal point like superman is the focal point of this story. yeah oh yeah. He, he is this story falls apart without superman but and i feel like, I feel like that's just, a that's totally true of the dcu though if no, you take absolutely. superman out of the well, dcu well clearly like, look I don't at what's think happening it, right now yeah i, I mean, don't think it functions properly well, I, I think I, that I, they actually did one smart thing in the death of superman which is they said without superman there you basically need to create four different heroes to encompass all of the things that superman or, is and I mean, well, you had steel who was the spirit of superman you had the Eradicator, who is the power of Superman. You had Superboy. And I you mean, had, uh, what was the other one? Clone the Cyborg Super- Superman. Cyborg Superman. Superman. Like, like you had all of these different the aspects of what that character is. <laughs> yeah. The bad guy of Superman. Wait. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the DCU doesn't function without Superman. And I think that's what this book like evaluates very clearly well, at the I, beginning. I it's agree. Like, it's out of control if you don't have it. And I, I think the interest, this, this kind of segues a little bit into something that I've been talking a lot about uh, with Toby and something I've been thinking about a lot lately. 
um, because more than anything, I think, you know, we, we're clearly living in a comic book age. More people are aware of these yeah. characters than probably ever before. Yeah. And um, you see Batman everywhere these days. Mm-hmm. Batman is fucking everywhere. Everybody loves Batman. Everybody wants to say that Superman is boring. He's overpowered. He's a well, boy scout, blah, blah, blah. It's, and I have a theory on this that's, that's basically the, what, what people like about Batman is not the fact that he's brilliant. It's not the fact that he has trained himself to be one of the best criminologists in the world. It's not the fact that he's a detective or a scientist or a tactician. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that he beats the shit out of everybody. Yeah. They, he's violent. He solves all of his problems with violence. Even, and they ignore all these other aspects of him. They want him to be dark and gritty yeah. and beating the shit out of everybody. And Superman doesn't do that. Superman is a humanitarian. Superman wants peace. He mm-hmm. would much rather understand an enemy and do what he can to help them and, and try and solve the root of the problem rather than to send them repeatedly to the hospital, which he could more than easily do. Well, he could, yeah. And people don't no want that about, because yeah. that is what takes effort you need to to try and understand other people that takes compassion it takes empathy oh, it takes man. sympathy and that's something that you know it's much easier to identify with the guy that's just kicking the shit out well, of everybody he disagrees and with and i think it's why world's finest is the perfect pairing for the dc universe is because you have two real disparaging ideas but i also think that when batman's written correctly he doesn't need to lay a finger on anyone. Oh, and I like, agree with you. Yes, he is a master tactician, but again, he doesn't have the superpowers that the Justice League no, has. No, he doesn't. So like, when he's in a Justice League book, he has to be more than just a guy that punches stuff. Absolutely. And I think that that's when Batman gets really interesting. I think uh, the Bat God that we're used to recently, uh, it's, it's, which is actually kind of going away, because I went back and reread uh, Court of Owls and stuff. Oh, no, it's recently, definitely gone And it's away. great, because it's nice to see Batman kind of lose again. Yeah. But I think what makes those two work so well together is you have Superman who's like, let's solve this with our minds. And you have Batman, you know, who is more than okay with punching someone and breaking their arm to get the information that he needs. Absolutely. And they make such a great good cop, bad cop team. And I love it when that role is reversed, too. When Superman plays the bad cop and his like eyes light up, X-ray, you know, or uh, heat vision. Well, yeah, and, I mean, he's and incredibly Bat- effective like, in that role. Yeah, and Batman's can, like, like "Oh, I'm not the face. one you don't want to piss off," because yeah. Superman's right there and he'll yeah. kill you. And they're like, "Oh, I'll tell you everything you want to know, Batman." Like, it works so well. And um, well, there's that great scene in Identity Crisis where uh, Green, like Kyle Rayner, has like trapped Deadshot and he shoots. And he like grazes his own neck, and he lets Kyle lets him out of the box. And everyone's like, "No, it's a trap!" And he turns around to run, and he runs right into Superman, who's just kind of hovering behind him. Yeah. And he like looks up, and he goes like this, and Superman's like, "Yeah, yeah. What are you gonna do?" I uh, which I think he's yeah. It's great to see him in that role. I think the best example of what Joe's talking about about the difference between like what makes Superman a really great character and what makes Batman a really great character, but also shows the flaws of both is the book um, Tower of Babel. Absolutely. Because that trade, yeah. which is out of print now, but which unfortunately, but that it's trade, coming back into print in this volume five or six of like those deluxe editions. Okay, cool. Doing. Um, it's gonna have all. It the- used to be volume seven of the old ones, yeah. but it's now a new number. But it includes the issue right before where they go in, they shrink down. Oh, Ray Palmer shrinks everybody oh, down, man. and they go inside a guy's brain who basically has like a small alien. It's civilization. like a sentient tumor. Yeah, living in there, is. and they all leave to go like let them, you know, let the doctors like operate or whatever. And Superman stays and like hangs out with that alien civilization to like be a humanitarian so and like. He's compass- the compassion that he shows in that one single issue, also written by Mark Wade, is like it's so it's so compelling. Like well, that yeah, one story, they... it makes me so happy to be a Superman fan. And I didn't always understand Superman. I was in that boat of like, oh, Superman's boring and Batman's cool. Until I read John Byrne's Superman, until I read oh, yeah. a lot more Superman books, and that one definitely like opened I think my heart. Some up of it comes Superman. with age too. I heard mm-hmm. Troutman was saying at the shop one day because there was a customer that you know had asked about Superman, and and, and Eric had had mentioned uh, some of his favorite stories, and the kid was still like, eh, I still don't like it, and he's like, that's fine. It's like his, that's like his favorite character. Yeah. And it's like but he's like uh, some of it honestly just you have to live a little bit, and yeah. then, and, and maybe it'll never be your thing. That's fine because I was the same way when I was a kid. I was like Dude, Batman is the shit, like well, he's yeah. awesome, but then it's like Superman boring and then yeah i read like the burn stuff and i read birthright and i was like 
Oh, I, I get it now. And that's yeah. what I think, like, this book and any... Because uh, we're also doing Red Sun um, on, on the next show. And the thing I love is, like, I, ch- I purposely... On, to, on the next episode of Out of the Fridge, out, which out is the, the other yeah, podcast yeah, that you're yeah. on. I, I didn't want to be all, like, you know, yeah. unclassy and so just you pimp pimp, myself. You can pimp up um, on your... <laughs> on, the next, on the next Out of the Fridge, um, I, did, I purposely went with two Elseworlds, Kingdom Come and Red Sun, because the whole thing with the Elseworlds is you take characters out of their element, and if you're a good writer... So you're not like Frank Miller doing Dark Knight. You actually <laughs> write those characters still in character. So right. even if it's like the 1800s or the future or this character was never powered or whatever it is that is different. And the thing about this that's great and Red Sun that's great is like, you know, in like Red Sun, you have a Soviet Superman where Stalin is his boss. Stalin, who killed nine million of his own people. Superman still doesn't kill in that book. Like, I love that personally. It's like that's he, got one of my favorite he endings thinks ever, he's doing. Oh, my God. It's so good. Um Again, as we were talking on the way over here, there's some question as to how much of it Morris, Grant Morrison wrote, because it doesn't read like anything else uh, Mark Millar wrote yeah. before or after, yeah. and it's really good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and it, that story is great, too, because, yeah, it's like, even in, in something like Red Sun, where you as an American would view him as, you know, the bad guy in that story, because he's this communist uh, he still doesn't hurt people. He still goes out of his way to help people. And in, in his mind, he, in his heart, he still thinks he's doing well, the right thing. And it's the other thing that's is. so hard to relate to about Superman is he has infinite power, essentially, but he doesn't use it. No. And yeah. how many of us could say the same thing is like, right. with that kind of power, you know, it's the, I mean, it's the Superman or the Spider-Man moniker with great power comes great responsibility. But yeah. like, for someone who has never and will never have the powers of Superman, I find it hard to imagine what I would do with that that was at all good. Yeah. Because it's so... Good. Walk it would right into a bank, whatever, you know. It would be so it tempting be to just that around. guy that cuts you off on the freeway, you know. Boom, well, that's what makes it you know, like, that, like, the temptation for me would be to try to make everything better. Like, to yeah, enforce exactly. my will to make well, the world the, my Alan vision Moore's, of perfection that's and Alan probably Moore. just destroy the whole thing in the process. That was Miracle Man for Alan Moore. It was basically oh, like, absolutely. if you have infinite power, like, you would shape the world in your image. Uh-huh. Like, you would be like, I'm going to create a utopia. And to make well, an omelet, Paul you have Dini to break some eggs. Too. And what was that? There was a Paul Dini story he did with Alex Ross, where it's like Superman delivering trees and things like that all around the world. And like yeah. he, it's one of those like I need to defeat all the starving kids in Africa. Yeah. Like, doing the same thing where it's like Superman's like I have all this power. Why don't I do everything? And it's kind of like he realizes he can't. I can't be that guy that yeah, you know. Like right. the world to some extent. And I think it, it, we've touched on this with Kingdom Come too. Just what, I think that's why he steps down. After, you know, Magog, you know, is acquitted or whatever. It's like, well, the people have spoken and Mm -hmm. I am not going to disrespect what the people want. Mm -hmm. I don't agree and I have my own ideals. But, you know, since I'm not their ruler, like if the will of the people is is something different, then so be it. Well, and this is I think this ties into what to my my point about the about Batman versus Superman. Right. It's like this is why. Superman is a compelling character because all, you know, everything I said before about him being compassionate and empathetic and just a good person, he doesn't have to be. Yeah. He could literally crack the earth in half and then go and fly off and find somewhere else. Well, you know, he doesn't, yeah. he, he doesn't need to be. Like people, it's like, oh, you looked at my wife. I'm going to melt your face off. I'm going to, because you know, I don't, I don't, I need to say this. I need to, because yeah. I've been holding this in for a while. <laughs> I don't, I don't give a fuck how much you've read Frank Miller. Superman wants Batman dead. Batman's dead. Oh, yeah. Thank sorry. you. I'm sorry. Thank that's, you. that's it. All right. Well, he goes up to space. Batman's like, oh, Superman. And then he's dead, right? Because it's, it's, it's just well, it. And that's, that's it. the thing I like about, uh, some interpretations of the Dark Knight Returns and and not that this is actually like in the book, but I think the reason that Batman wins in that scenario is because Superman doesn't want to win. No, he, do, he gives like, up. He yeah, gives up. I mean, like that's, that's the he, only he reason thinks Bruce's why. heart is giving out. So that's that's why I, I get so mad at fanboys. We're like, yeah. oh oh, Batman fucking whooped his ass, and then I'm yeah. like, did we read the same book? Yeah. It's like, all right, you had Green Arrow shooting uh, shooting the the Kryptonite. You had you, you had a Superman who would just like save the world from a nuclear bomb. Mm-hmm. Do, do you not remember that part? And so he's all emaciated and fucked up from that. So he's like clearly not at his regular powers at le- yeah. level. And you have Batman plugged into that electric grid, and even then, Superman stops himself. Yeah. Do you not fucking remember that? Part? Yeah. I mean, he stops himself because he thinks Bruce is killing himself. And that's what's so I find it so interesting in like Superman Batman stories is because the only person that Clark trusts 
to take him down is if everything goes wrong. Yeah. Well, is because Bruce. but even then, I think if that ever happened, if Clark ever stepped over the line and Bruce came and was like, "It's time to end it," Clark would let him. He would because that, he that's, never. We've seen stories. To, we've seen yeah. stories where he's he's he like he's like in hush where he's like mm-hmm. kind of under. Oh yeah. Uh, um, Poison Ivy's control. Yeah. Even then, he's with it enough that he right. allows Batman. To. Yeah, yeah. And that's but that's the, like again, Jeff Loeb still being able to write at that point. Like yeah. wrote that beautifully, where yeah. it's like I was in control enough. Because yeah, a fully powered Superman would still kill him. Doesn't matter. But yeah. like he w- he was with it enough that he's like I slowed myself well, down enough. I did whatever I needed to do. The thing that about Superman is out. like he has so much power, but he has to keep it in control all the mm-hmm. time. Because yeah. if he actually hit Batman as hard as he could, he would, like be paced on the yeah, wall. exactly. Yeah. There's and actually. So, I just think it's so interesting, and I think the other thing about Superman that's great is like we've seen iterations of a Superman like character that go into space and just essentially conquer planets mm. like the the Saiyans of Dragon Ball Z are essentially like power level yeah. Superman just go to planets and conquer them in the Vultrumanites which yeah. are like very similar to the Saiyans oh, in, in Dragon Ball Z yeah. in, in, uh, in Invincible uh, basically that's what his dad does when he leaves Earth is like I'm just gonna go to another planet and do whatever cause I no one can stop them and that's what's so cool about Superman is no one can stop him. There is no villain in the DC universe stronger than Superman. Arguably none. And well, like I was saying at the beginning, Superman's weaknesses are human weaknesses. Like if yeah. Batman ever really had to fight Superman, he would attack his psyche. Oh yeah. And that's what's oh, yeah. the other half of what it, I was saying like, earlier. If Batman would win or lose before a single punch was thrown, before Superman was even aware that Batman was moving against him. Right. Because if Superman becomes aware that Batman is trying to harm him, he'll stop him. He'll just, it's over in less than a second. And that's what's the other half that's great about Tower of Babel is the reason that Batman, quote unquote, wins in those scenarios is because he hid everything from Superman. Mm -hmm. And that book is just such a great dichotomy of those two characters. And the conflict that they have at the end of that book is like, it's such a turning point in the DCU, but it's also just a great analysis of those two's character yeah i always think of uh one of my favorite batman superman moments is at the end of and i'm doing this partially to torment toby because he hates Jeff isn't that Lowe. everything you do yeah yeah that's yeah, it's yeah. true <laughs> um at the end of emperor joker where uh superman is talking to mixie he's talking to mixel Pl- Pitalix, and yeah. uh he uh batman has just been through an ordeal the likes of which no nobody could possibly imagine and and Mixie is saying he's never going to be the same. And Superman goes, well, what if you could take those memories away and give them to somebody else? And Mixie's like, who? And that's never implied. It's, it's only implied. They never outright and say it. But Superman takes them. He takes them for Bruce because he knows he can deal with it. Yeah. Because he knows that. And this is the interesting thing, right? The world needs Superman. The world also needs Batman. Yeah. Because... Somebody has to do what needs to be done. Well, and I think that that's what's so great about the DC Universe is the Justice League. Yeah, absolutely. Like they each oh, yeah. play such well, a role. Well, and specifically role. the Trinity. Oh, I you hate know, that. when, Don't, well, when no. Jim Lee was. <laughs> no, it's got to be. It doesn't have to be Wonder Woman. I know. No, you need to shut up. Wonder no. Woman needs to be there too because no. Wonder Woman is willing. Wonder. She's the one that will cross that line. Batman like the, are both the, idealists. Yeah. Wonder Woman is a realist. Wonder Woman looks but at a so scenario. Are so many other heroes, and she's in the, the only. DC yeah, but she. But can she actually throw has the power to back Superman it up too, like a love and don't. Yeah. Yeah. I think that another. I mean, like arguably that she is important, but I don't think the Trinity is the important part of the DC universe. I think that a DC universe without Martian Manhunter would be like a. No, universe, I'm not a, a Green Lan- I, It would be a Justice League not uh, worth having. I kind of agree with Chart. I really see the DC universe mythology as really being ultimately a dualist system. Yeah. With Superman and Batman as light and dark. Yeah. Aspects of the divinity, I guess. Just as Metropolis is DC during the day and Gotham is, D- is uh, and New York Metropolis City Metropolis is the Jim utopia. Lee, yeah, Jim Lee had that image when he did For Tomorrow in Hush. Like those initial covers. There's yeah. one where Batman, it's nighttime and he's standing on the gargoyle. Oh, looking yeah. Regal yeah. Superman as fuck. Standing and then Superman's standing on the gargoyle as the eagle. daytime. No, and I love that because you put them together. Or whatever the hell. They, yeah. But I love that because you mash them together. And it's like, to me, I love that because I, I love I like Superman more. But I like I love Batman too. Yeah. And it's like, I'm the light, I'm the dark, I'm the yin, I'm the yang. You yeah. get the night shift, I get the day shift. It's yeah. like, you need both. The flip sides of the same yeah. That's why I think Wonder Woman is important because she represents the gray in between. If you want to yeah. say, I think the whole rest of the universe when, is in between. When, well, I mean, you can say that, but 
the thing is, is that if Superman ever went back, Wonder Woman could stand toe to toe with him. She may not be able to do she, it for long. She doesn't have to though. Like that, I think it's a fallacious argument because that in no way will Superman ever go so bad well, that Wonder Woman uh, no, will have to take clearly, him down. But because he doesn't trust Wonder Woman to take him down. He never goes to Diana and goes, "Here's a sword made of kryptonite. If I go bad, kill me." He does that to Bruce. He gives he knows that to that Bruce. She would do it like she would use it all the time. Yeah, yeah, right? Bruce would talk to a person and be like, oh, "I think he's don't, dead." He's <laughs> don't think for a second that Superman isn't there's some degree of like uh because I could easily make an argument that Superman knows that Batman would exhaust every other option. Well, yeah, I know, and that's Batman why he goes to them first, because yeah. it's that's a mutual relationship of trust. Like, I understand that Wonder Woman is an extremely important character, and I get that she's now a, like a, a female icon at DC, and that's great. My argument is not that there should not be a female character in the pantheon of the DCU. I believe it should exist in the JLA. As the JLA, as the pantheon of God. Well, I think, yeah. Because it is, the, it is that God divinity story where, like, this is a pantheon of gods. You have major gods, like Batman and Superman, and you have minor gods, like Flash, Green Lantern, regardless of their power level, because arguably the Flash is, like, the most, the power, most powerful. Yeah, no, and, and so, regardless of their power level, those are the major gods and the minor gods, and there are a lot... I think the idea of a trinity isn't one that works within the DC Universe. I think it's pandering. I feel like it's like, oh, look, also a female character is just as good. And it's like, yes, there are amazing female characters in the DC Universe. That's great. But that team of Batman and Superman is not a it's it's not about that. It's not about a trinity. There's no give and take. They don't need Wonder Woman to be compelling. Uh, I mean, I the don't, DC Universe I'm not, needs Wonder Woman. I'm but, not saying that they need. I, I mean, their I just relationship, think the trinity is. I'm talking about in the DC universe as a whole, the Justice League is important, and in the Justice League, the Trinity is important. I think that the Trinity is a pandering and tacked on. Well, I, I'm a huge I X-Men don't. guy, and my thing with the X-Men is uh, Wolverine is is the one uh, up until recently, it was like, X-Men just never kill, and Wolverine was always like, well, I will. Like, yeah. He's always that guy. Mm-hmm. And Wonder Woman is that for the Justice yeah, League. Absolutely. She's different than Wolverine in any other way, but just like that yeah. same kind of thing. We're like, well, I'm a warrior. So I kind of view her like that. Where well, there are great times in the Within DC the framework universe. of the team, it works really well. Yeah, yeah the, the idea of the Trinity is, is a weird one, too. The DC I haven't universe... read much with just the three of them. That's any... Yeah, it good. needs but, Wonder Woman within the like, league. Yeah, this uh, book actually is the best representation of the Trinity I think there has ever been. Yeah, probably. because it's this book is such a duality of Wonder Woman versus Superman. For the majority of the book, they disagree. She comes to him and she's like, "You need to come back." He's like, "I don't want to do that." She comes to him and is like, "You need to be the leader of this team." He's like, "I can't do that." And she's like, "I'll do it." She they go to the prison to fight and she's like, You need to kill these people and he's like, I won't and she's like, I will. And so she does everything that Superman's not willing to do. Batman in the story pl- serves a different role than he normally does. Because he's old and he's not the he he can't be the hero that he once was. He's now got robots and a team of people that he's assembled. He's now like more of a mastermind character. And yeah. the Trinity in this book works really well because Batman can't be Batman. The element I loved about this that they haven't done too much is I love that he's kind of the perfect counterpoint to Luther. That's something yeah. like, it makes a lot of sense. Both super rich, super intelligent guys. Yeah. How come we don't see contemporary oh, stories I that love, do that more? I love the story when it's like Wayne Tech versus oh, yeah. Luther. Yeah, uh, I love it when like, it happens. I, I, just, so I don't think cool. there's a lot of times I've seen oh, yeah, it. It but needs to happen more. It should, because I want to see like brain, you know, well, Bruce also, Wayne, not just brawn Bruce even Wayne. Even if Lex know? Luthor doesn't know that Bruce Wayne is Batman... Bruce Wayne is the perfect villain to Luthor. Like, yeah, should, just business Bruce wise. Wayne versus Lex Luthor business books should be really interesting. And oh, yeah. it was something that we read in uh, Luthor, when we talk about that on an yeah. older episode, that I really didn't like about that book, was that Batman and Luthor like immediately teamed up. Because they're like, oh, we're big businessmen, and we like big business, let's be friends. And it's like, that's not really how that yeah, works. Like, see. big business competes. Like, it's, there, it's a competition. And even if they appear friendly up front... Like there's so much like corporate espionage and stuff that could be told in a in a DC just universe. Ethically, that would be Bruce interesting. Wayne would still, even well, if it made business sense, you know, he still. The other thing really is, there's there. so many cool companies in the DC universe that are backed by superheroes, like Ted Korg, Korg had Industries, Korg Industries yeah. and uh, Luther Corps, and then there's you know, I just it, think that uh, 
Beast? No, Beast of Gold didn't have anything, did he? And yeah, uh, what's the stuff. one that Amanda Waller works for? Uh, oh, God. Uh, what what's is it? that called? Oh, uh, Checkmate? No, no, it's... Uh, uh, it's uh, oh, God, I'm switching. Uh, um, I want to say Cyberdyne, but that's bro, that's uh, Terminator. Mm. Uh, <laughs> no, it's Cyberdyne. Fantastic. Amanda Waller works for Cyberdyne. No, so, what is it? She works for, like... She worked for the uh, Checkmate. No, when she had, like... She worked for, like, a, the where the Superman clone was made. Oh, it's not Star Labs. Um, uh, oh, there's Star Labs, Labs too. Star Labs, but, uh, Labs. No, Cadmus. Oh. Cadmus. 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 Thank you. Cadmus. Okay. Oh so there's God. like all this great like super sciencey like Cadmus. business stuff that I think that could really be integrated into the DC universe. And yeah. I think this book actually, I think that's a good point. Is like Bruce Wayne versus Lex Luthor, yeah. or teamed up with Lex Luthor and then against Lex Luthor like, is like ah, it's so cool. Yeah, there's well, so beating him in his own game elements. too. Like, boy, well, you know, I was gonna double cross you. Please. Oh yeah, I, I love it when he's like, he's like, oh, you double crossed me, and he's like, I learned. From you, yeah, no, yeah. I learned from watching you. Yeah, it's yeah. So good. Actually, I was just thinking one of the cool things about the 2099 setting mm. was uh, I mean, the world was basically ruled by megacorps at that yeah. point, one of which was Stark Fujikawa. Mm-hmm. Although, I mean, Tony Stark is long dead. How cool would it be to see a DC setting like that where it's like Wayne Tech and well, uh, Luther Corp? Like, yeah. as the corporations that rule the world, like a cyberpunk dystopian yeah. DC future. I, I think that where that all that is going Beyond on. fits super well into that. It does. So, I would love to see... I always want more Batman Beyond stuff. Oh, yeah. Also, Bat, can, I guess the one thing we haven't talked about that much in this book is the art. Um, oh, yeah. In which I always am like, Alex Ross, eh, hit or miss. And when I first read this, it was like in my early days of reading comics and it kind of like stargazed me where I was just like, ooh, yeah, comics can be yeah. so different. And then the second time I read it, I was like, this is kind of static and boring. But now this time again, reading it like more matured, uh, maybe uh, I <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I found a lot of stuff that I found relatively. Yeah. Relatively. Uh, art wise, I think I've matured a little bit. I find it beautiful. Like there's some really beautiful oh, no, panels no, 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 in this book yeah. that I totally overlooked before. And although there is a lot of like posing, uh, basically splash page cover, like images in this book, there is still a lot of really, really beautiful moments. I mentioned the one with, um, Orion before, but there are so many great establishing shots, great facial expressions, great action scenes. I love the uh, part with um, Superman and Wonder Woman up in space. And oh, Wonder Woman yeah. like, throws the thing, and then Superman uses the lasso to get an oh, asteroid. An asteroid and then there's just this very touching scene where he's handing it back, and it takes like the art goes through the entire page of yeah. him handing back the... The lasso. Yeah, yeah. it's just... yeah. Alex Ross so often doesn't work for me. I mean, I complained yeah. pretty hard about Marvels. Right. And for whatever reason in this, it just works. Well, it's like it's, it, it builds up the pomposity and the yeah. epicness of the right. story that's being told. I mean, it feels like, I mean, I don't quite want to say like a Da Vinci painting, but like you get that kind of like classical well, this uh, is, Renaissance painting style where it feels like these are the events that shape history. Like, being depicted yeah it feels very like uh iconic in that these characters are more than just people like when you look at old paintings that really like mean to deify a person like a king or paintings of gods yeah it's there's just this imagery that's used in those paintings and i feel like this really taps into that making everything so much more iconic because these are godlike characters that mm. they're talking about. They're treated with reverence, not only in the writing, but in the art. Yeah, it really is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's such an important work. Like, all the writing aside, there are very few comic books that look anything like this. Yeah. And I think it really <clears throat> shows the power and the flexibility of the comic book medium yeah. to tell stories. Mm-hmm. Well, and it sets a different mood than your average drawn penciled inked colored digitally it really does it sets such a different tone and this is the kind of thing that i miss from dc when they had the balls to basically like put out these crazy elseworlds books i'm sure it took alex ross a long time to draw this book Mm -hmm. because he painted every panel he paints these on canvas you know like as paintings like that's insane to me nobody else has the time 
to work like that anymore because it's all about the you know cranking issues out every month and doing something like quick fast paced really quick turnaround um that to have you know to just have the ability to be like oh we're going to tell an elseworld story and time limit is not an issue because this art will live on so much longer than the monthly issues that I I just miss DC Elseworlds so oh, much. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. We say this every time we talk about an Elseworld, basically yeah. every episode. Yeah. But this is what made DC great for me, was being able to, even if I wasn't reading continuity at the time, to be able to go pick up an Elseworlds story like Gotham by Gaslight or this or oh, Red God. Sun and just be able to read it and enjoy the characters I really like. Yeah, yeah I mean, I kind of feel like there's an element that you would miss if you weren't familiar with the DC universe at all reading yeah. this. But I feel like I would – I want to recommend this to people who haven't read DC and go, look, this is what – this is what's good about the DC well, universe. Like people this that is like, what they want. And people that like the new 52 are like – you know, people are like, oh, I just saw Man of Steel and now I'm going to go pick up a Superman book. And they read you know, the Superman stuff that's going on now and they're like, I don't really get it. Why is this cool? You'd be like, well, it's not. <laughs> but – here is some stuff this that is, is good. really here's some cool. good stuff. Like here's some, some stuff, stuff that makes you know that makes comic books worth reading as yeah. a superhero medium. You know, like these superheroes are not always the greatest things written in comics. We've all read our fair share of mediocre to pile of shit superhero comics. There's but a lot of them. This is what makes reading all the comics I've ever read worth reading. Are books like this yeah. where it's like the first time I read this, I didn't know very much about the DCU, so things didn't have as much impact. But when I went back and read it years later and I knew more about these characters, it had such a strong impact on me that it works whether you know a lot about the characters, whether you don't, whether you are familiar with comics, whether you're kind of new to comics. Like, I think this works on a lot of different levels. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing. When you mentioned the characters, um, when I was reading this, uh, I mean, I really like the Spectre. He's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, I even though it's never mentioned, I sort of got this vibe that part of Hal Jordan is there. Did anybody else get that? Um, uh, this would have been this before well he before. was the Spectre. Well before, yeah, he was pre Final Night. Yeah, huh. I think he was still alive. Yeah, this, yeah. This he died was, in Final uh, Night, and then later was bonded to the Spectre. This is what's his face. This is the original. It's, yeah. It was still Jim Corrigan. Yeah, he Jim pulls Corgan. back his mask, and yeah. it's like he's been a Spectre for so long. That's yeah. what yeah, part was so interesting. And, and, yeah, because yeah. it's like even though you have a human host, you've been the Spectre for so long that you've lost your humanity, and right. so like yeah. Norman has to be that. And like and like you were saying, Chard, with the the scene where Superman is freaking out, he's kind of that for Superman as well. So right. it's like there's a dual role yeah. like, well, for the Spectre and Superman. I have to be Well, and I think what's really that, interesting yeah. about this versus Marvel's is in Marvel's, the the, char- the main character, the photographer, whose name I've forgotten, that you see the world through, he is a character in that universe. Yeah, like he, it's Phil something. Yeah, he has to react and take action to certain things in that. And in this, he uh, Norman is a passive character. Like, he only really interacts with the DC universe like two times. One when they're in the watchtower. When the Green Flash Lanterns. finds him, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, who are you? What are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I'm here to stop apoc- uh, the apocalypse. I'm here to keep everything from going bad. And Superman's like, so are we. Whatever. Bye. And then at the end, when he has to quell Superman, yeah. Superman's anger. And so he's so much you playing the role in the book of just like being the passenger through the book that I find it really interesting. And the Spectre is almost talking you know, to the viewer about oh, absolutely. A lot of, to the reader, absolutely. I guess, about a lot this of this whole thing is an appeal to the reader. Yeah, I mean, well, that's it's, what's it's really a meta great comic. About it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and it's done in uh, uh, it's done in a really approachable way. You know, I don't ever feel. Uh, I don't think be, it ever feels like you're getting in over your head. You know, no, it's, it can feel preachy at times. Like I agree with Joe, but it is like it's an important book, and I can yeah. I can excuse some some of the preachiness for like, well, this might go over some people's heads. So yeah, yeah you kind of have to hammer home your point. Well, and well, I, I think, f- but I, I like, think, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I feel like if Mark Wade had written this now, it would be more subtle. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. was one of my, like in, in reading and I had the same rereading, I had the same thing where like, I, I did still really enjoy the story. Now that I know a lot more about DC, those kind of winks and nods, I did enjoy more, but the actual narrative was more on the nose than I recall it being. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, let, let the, 
let the art and the movement of the art push the story forward as much as possible. I don't I don't like when you ever have to say what the mission statement is of the mm, comic. Right. And it was very clearly stated in this and it pretty pretty implicitly. Um, I feel like, yeah, Wade now um, would do it a little differently. Yeah, at least going off of what he's done. The other thing that I find about this book rereading it is that it holds up (laughs) so well. It really uh, does feel kind of timeless. So long ago. Oh yeah. Uh, well, so long ago. No, for a book that was written quite a while ago in comic terms, almost twenty years. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, that's a big. That's Uh, I mean, I guess fifteen years. Fifteen years, like that's a big amount of time. Like a lot has changed in comics. Oh, absolutely. So much has changed, not only in the universe, but in the way that we read comics and the way that we perceive comics as a trade medium and a digital medium now. And, you know, with with Internet comics and everything, it's surprising to me that this still holds up. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a great a great mark towards this book is that it is so well written that it feels timeless. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's very well, clearly a reaction to the 90s. And if you were alive reading books in the 90s, it means more to you. But if you never read a 90s comic, I still think that this holds up. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Well, like Toby, you had kind of said uh, at the beginning of this, I, I think one of the, the ironies of this is you read Kingdom Come Now. And yeah, New 52 is like what this is talking against, yeah. really. Because yeah. they, they are like the new image, the old Marvel. It's yeah. all... Yeah. Punisherized. Well, the know, new Superman around. is pretty much Magog. It's I mean, yeah, he's pretty it's, much Magog. Yeah, he's he's killing much. people, and he's you know. He's, I mean, I, people ask me at the shop all the time because I mean, I try not to be negative. I try not to insult books of the people like I usually just I won't say anything. If, yeah, you know. But if someone someone will ask me straight up, "Hey, man, X, what do you think about New Fifty Two Superman or or whatever?" If it's pretty much anything New Fifty Two, I'm like. Ugh. It's, it's, not my cu- it's not my cup. Well, I try to just say, you know what, man, it's not my cup of tea. And I try to leave it at that. But if someone keeps pushing, well, I thought you liked Superman. Like, I'll be wearing my Superman t-shirt. And I'm like, I do. I like heroic Superman. You know? Yeah. I, uh, I, that's, that's what I'm into. And it's, yeah, I think that this may be more than it did five years ago. Definitely is, a t- is like... It's home. It feels, <laughs> it's home, it feels yeah. important because the of things that it's criticizing on. are what DC is doing right yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I think it's why people like Mark Wade have a lot to complain about about the way that these characters are being portrayed now is because he's like look didn't we learn our lesson you know 10 15 years ago i thought that was what we were doing at dc at the time is like moving comics forward as a medium yeah. and dc took some huge step back steps backwards with the new 52. well like we did we were talking about wally west earlier uh reading the initial <laughs> wally west solo stuff i mean he was a complete asshole when he first oh, when came out. Yeah. But and the Med- thing was, it was yeah. like he was like a 19, you know, 20-year-old kid. His mentor, his father figure had just died. He was going... Even then, though, even with like as much... Because he was selfish as hell. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. Give me health insurance. Yeah. Whatever it was. And it was, you know, part of it was like trying to reflect the 80s being the me decade right. and all that. Uh, but even during that, it's like you felt like, okay, it was this... He was just—he was a kid, and even within like the first forty, fifty issues, he grows and changes yeah. and becomes oh, more heroic and more selfless. And it's this constant journey. So by the the time that book ends in like two thousand six or whatever, he's like he's married, he has two kids, he's like yeah. super into his family, like he is heroic. He's he's like a role model to people. Well, and he's become the Flash that Keystone needs, and then well, yeah, he's like, get what he needs. And he's, he's now a mentor to a new absolutely kid Flash. Yeah, right? like that's so important. He comes completely full circle. Yeah, uh, and. And I, and I feel like with the New 52, for the most part, um, if if I was reading Superman now and it was like, yes, it's a younger, more inexperienced... Because this is like people that try to convince me to read Superman. Yeah. Like, no, Eric, you just don't get it. It's just a younger, more inexperienced Superman. I'm like, no, I disagree with you. Like, Because I've read... Because we've read that Superman. Well, we've like, read for, Birthright. Right. We've read John exactly. Byrne's yeah, Superman. Exactly. And those handle that so exactly. much better. Exactly. And it's like, okay, because like, like in, in Man of Steel, it's like you, you have him, you know, being the star quarterback, how Pa's upset with him because he's basically using his, his powers to further himself and you know it's like well no man you know that you're better than that and he knows that he's he's upset his his father and like he is upset with himself that you know it's like oh, i didn't even realize i was doing that so that's like a, like that's like a 17 18 year old you yeah. know so it's like even then it's like all right i did some selfish things because you're a kid and he's not perfect but you know i'm gonna make steps to not not do things like that anymore and uh this uh current superman the the thing that I you know we beat this to death. Is like editorial is just so confused because the uh, Superman Unchained. I don't know if you guys have read that one at all, uh, but that's the Scott Snyder and Jim Lee book. Uh, I've read the first three of the four issues, and it's actually really good. 
The thing is, though, it's not New 52 Superman. Like, it looks like New 52 Superman. He's wearing the outfit. Like, you read it. Like, Scott Snyder is is riding, like, down on, like, the farm, Smallville. I am really Clark Kent. He's he's riding, like, John Byrne. Yeah. He's, he's riding birthright, kind of that Superman, the one that's like, I'm human. Like, I know that I'm from Krypton, and I... I like that's cool. That's part of who I am. That's why I design the outfit the way I do, and, and that's cool. But I'm also I'm from here. Like I'm yeah. I'm adopted. I'm an orphan, but I'm from here. So I'm call me Clark. Like my name yeah. is Clark. Like like that's the Superman that I I find interesting, and that's what Snyder's writing. And I find it interesting that no one is talking about that and bringing that up because yeah. the book is selling like hotcakes, and everyone's just like, oh my god, Jim Lee art and whatever. But it's like he's and it is a good book, but it's like he's 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 not writing New Fifty Two Superman. Yeah, and I think that is one of the most major flaws of all the flaws in the New 52. Like, resetting all the characters is probably my biggest gripe. But yeah. this, my second biggest gripe is that, like, none of the characters feel, like, as defined as they did pre-New 52. Well, they all, like, tend to slide the scale of... You heard what they just did with sort Superboy. Of a character and now he, Well, no, I didn't the, hear the, they're, they're, they're killing... The, the current Superboy that's been the New 52 Superboy for this entire two years, they are killing off... And they are introducing because he's a clone, so it's of course it's going to look exactly the same. Uh, the new version is going to be, uh, I think it's like John Lane Kent or something like that, and he's like a future offspring of Lois and and Clark. Um, but aren't isn't Lois? I know. Well, that's exactly. Aren't we getting a little bit far from Kingdom Come though? Yeah, I mean, I guess, but that's one of the things that we are talking about. Well, say they're replacing book, their like, characters like in their own their books. It's like they did the yeah. Lobo because they, they, they are admitting that they're, well, they're not full on admitting, but the, it, by changing, doing these super drastic changes, yeah. it's like they're... Well, I and know. I think that Kingdom Come was a direct opposition to everything that was happening in the 90s with characters like Lobo and yeah. they're doing the exact same thing. Well, again. and to yeah. bring it full circle, Kingdom Come is what happens when you have a vision. Yeah, or something a story you want to tell. Well, it's and this cohesive. Is a, a lot of this and is Alex Ross's vision too. Yeah, like he came and I to mean, Mark Wade for this. And I think that uh, I think that Kingdom Come represents, you know, it, it talks about the the darkening of superheroes, but it also represents something that DC used to be good at, which was creativity and innovation, and legacy, and legacy. Which now they've just completely flushed down the toilet. So yeah, I, I mean, exactly. I think it's such a strong point of this book is that you have these golden age heroes, and we have all seen the future iterations of those characters. But in this universe, in the Kingdom Come universe, none of those iterations seem to have happened really. Yeah, like Wally West isn't in this book. Hal Jordan isn't in this book. Uh, you know, Kyle Rayner's not in this book. Like none of those iterations have come along. What you have instead is these superheroes that weren't mentored by Golden Age and right. Silver Age characters. And therefore, they don't know how to act. Yeah. Essentially, it's like kids with bad parents, you know? They, yeah, they just no, don't know how to exactly behave themselves. What it is. Exactly you got what a is. guy with a cow head and a giant laser gun, and he's just going <laughs> to shoot anybody that's in his way to get to a villain. Because nobody told him how to act. And that's what this book is, oh, is very I'm, much about. Is uh, like The DC Universe operates the way that it does because... We have a legacy. Yeah. And that's my favorite part about the DC universe is the legacy. And it's what doesn't exist at all in right the current now. 52. Yeah, so it's like, well, it's why I don't read it. Yeah. When people ask me why I don't read it, it's because like, there's no legacy anymore. All the characters that I loved and grew up on, they're gone. They when people ask yep. me why I don't read it, I say because it's awful and it's hateful and awful. It's poo-poo butter. <laughs> it's poo-poo butter. Yeah, yeah that's West what I usually hear you say. Because, yeah, that's right. my short answer. Wally West, where is he? Yeah. Well, that's why. all right. I think we've... Killed this We've book. killed, killed it to death. Yeah. Rush so, uh, Rex. Let's move on to recommendations. Yeah. Rex. Joe, you want to go first? I, at the behest of a good friend of mine, I uh, brought Scud, which I haven't brought in since Toby was new to the podcast. Yeah, you recommended it a long um, time ago. And uh, we could say that I'm doing it in honor of Dan Harmon coming back to community. Yeah. Uh, which, isn't that why you did it before? Was I Because he was leaving community. <laughs> And now I'm doing it because he's coming back. So yeah. that's a nice little... I yeah. like that. You it's you know, a nice little continuity. Uh, Scud, the disposable assassin, I have the whole shebang here. We probably wouldn't read all of it, but... Oh, um, it's pretty quick. It is pretty quick. Uh, basically, uh, Adventures of a Robot Assassin uh, who gets hired to kill this uh, monster whose name is escaping me right now. And... Uh, 
realizes pretty early on that if uh, uh, Scud realizes that if he kills um, his mark, he'll die. Because he's a disposable assassin. Because he's a disposable yeah. assassin. So he basically shoots its arms and legs off and then pays for its life support. And so he has to go out and take jobs so he can make money to pay for the hospital stay of the, his mark. Yeah. And that's pretty much what the whole story is about. But it, 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 it's just one of the best things. It's incredibly humorously yeah. written. It's yeah. got shades of the tick yeah. and also Deadpool. And it's, if you like stuff like Empowered, if you thought God Hates Astronauts that I was talking about last week sounded interesting, yeah, I mean, those books wouldn't really exist without the tick and Scud. Scud, yeah. And Scud is very surreal at times. The character designs are the most unique thing I've ever seen in my yeah, entire life the art's black and white but it is yeah, gorgeous it's um, absolutely amazing uh and it's good it's just solidly it's, good it's reverent and hilarious yeah. and uh, yeah it's a good good stuff and it's a lot of fun to read and go get the whole shebang it's a phone book from image yeah and, it and it's like cheap. 20 it's 30 bucks it's such a good deal for like for, uh you know that's huge a, book. that's a good value yeah. it, it could is. easily Mine's, be 40 for how big it is yeah Mine's you could beat up and kill a child with this book you probably could. uh mine's beat up and needs to be replaced but uh, uh it's a well, lot of love yeah. a lot of love here and it's it's one of my favorite things to read and, uh yeah it's a good good one well, awesome that's, that's eric good. what'd you bring I brought Battling Boy by Paul Pope. Uh, on Out of the Fridge, we did uh, a Thor God-sized episode um, a couple weeks back when the Thor came out in the theater. And it'll uh, be like a month ago by the time this it, episode no doubt, comes out. No doubt, no um, doubt. Well, we did our, our Thor episode, and what we try to do on the show is like talk about a more mainstream book, like everyone's at least heard of Thor, and then we do kind of a counterpoint. Hmm. This book isn't a, isn't a lot like Thor, uh, other than Battling Boy's father is basically like a Thor. Style yeah. character, um, I haven't even read the whole thing yet, uh, but uh, it's come highly recommended to me. The part I read, there was a, it actually comes charred like you're always talking about. It's it's like an original graphic novel. Yeah. There, there is like uh, the first chapter was this death of Haggard West, uh, little one shot comic mm-hmm. that came out. That I, I read the whole thing. That was really cool because. It says on it, it's like issue 101, and it's like, oh, thanks, fans, for all the years. And it's like, it's so funny because I actually had some friends who were like, oh, man, this book's been around for that long. Dude, it's a one. It, no, it's like, yeah. it's just, some people totally bought it and yeah. <laughs> cause they got like fake le- letters, pages, and that kind of thing. Uh, but basically, it starts with this uh, Rocketeer style character, Haggard West, and uh, he gets killed in this story, and he's like the big, you know, protector of this, you know, this world, of our world in it. And uh, his, he's got a daughter whose name is escaping me at the moment, but she's like the next in, in line to take over. This kid, Battling Boy, his people are from outer space, are kind of similar to like Asgardians. She ends up saving the day. He kind of accidentally kind of takes credit for her, so everyone's like, oh, Battling Boy, you're the man, and she just kind of like, you know, lets it ride. And, um, and I guess there's supposed to be at least like three more of these, and they're going to alternate. So like the next story after this is going to all, all be from her perspective. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see. Like she's in this here and there, but it's more from Battle and Boy's perspective. And they're just they're just gonna each one. They're basically basically each gonna get like two books and it'll bounce back and forth. Uh, but yeah, this one it, it's only been out for like maybe a month. Yeah, it's sold read, out of diamond. Like I read this right when away. it came out. Sam recommended it to me and really liked it. So it's someone I've been kind of saving to, to pitch maybe. But yeah, yeah. But it's a. There's been a lot of buzz fun. about it. Um, Chris, who we had you know as a guest on the show, he read it twice in one week. Because uh, he read it just when he bought it because he loved it so much. Uh, he's he's just really into Paul Pope. And he kept talking to me about it at work. Dude, you got to read this book, man. you got to read this book. And then he was having a conversation with a friend of his. And his friend referenced something in the book that he hadn't caught. So he was like, what? So he went back and reread the entire <laughs> book just for that. And then we had him on the show and he read it a third time. So within uh, two weeks, he read it three times. And yeah. took all these details. And, but he was hardcore into it. And the thing that's cool about this is it's written to be a book uh, for kids. So yeah. it's not like hyper violent. Doesn't have a lot of cursing and stuff. Paul Pope, kind of his mission statement with this was, uh, you know, because like with the New Fifty Two and lots of stuff, it's so hyper violent and sexualized. He he wanted something that a kid could actually read, and this has well, you know tons of action and things like that. But it's not. It's graphic. something that we've talked about a lot on comics. Is like all ages doesn't mean dumbed down. Yeah, yeah. Like, and this yeah. is all not ages dumbed down. means that it's everyone can read it, and yeah. this is a great example of like an all ages book that. Everyone can appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and Paul Pope went to Didio and wanted to do a commodity book. Which still hurts with Azarella. Yeah. This seems with to Azarella. be kind of in direct response to that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and good for him because, like, yeah. fuck Dan DiDio. But he, you know what? Yeah, that's a, I love that, like, Paul Pope can, can just do his own thing. I like yeah, it. Yeah, create our own works. That's great. So good. And, like, what Toby always own, yeah. says, it's like, thank you, DC, for pushing everybody to doing their own creator yeah, works right? because no one wants to work for DC right now. Yeah. So, thank you, DC, for Battling Boy. Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> no, yeah, if, if this DC. is. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Toby, what uh, that? So I actually have one quick announcement. I meant oh, to yeah. put it at the top of the show, but I completely forgot. So I'm just going to drop it right here in the middle of the recommendation so that oh, hopefully people will listen to it and not at the very end of the episode. So we put up a donation link on our webpage yeah. to kind of defray some of the costs of like web hosting and materials and just general costs that we right. have associated with the podcast. Um, if you want to donate, that's awesome. It's by no means required. And I just wanted to say a very big thank you to anyone who has donated. Yeah, already. we did get some donations already. So thank you very much, guys. Yeah, you're cool. great. And yeah. you know who you are. We love you. Uh, so my recommendation for this week is uh, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. You probably already know about this, but if you ha- know nothing about it, it came out in 2000. And it's basically... The League of Extraordinary, uh, excuse me, the Justice League of America, eighteen ninety eight edition with literary characters. With literary yes, characters. basically, Alan Moore took all of these old, like Victorian and pulp era characters, like Mina Harker from Dracula, the Invisible and Man, the Invisible Man, Doctor Jekyll, Jekyll and Mister Hyde, and Alan Quartermain. Uh, from King Solomon's Mind. Yeah. Um, and the Seven Cities. The, uh, yeah. Nemo from 20, or 10,000 Leagues Under the Sea. 20,000 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, Leagues Under the Sea. Yep. Captain Nemo. But he basically took all of these characters and imagined what if all of this literature were taking place in a superhero style universe. Like mm-hmm. shared universe. Yeah. And assembled these characters in a Justice League or Avengers style super team. Yeah. To battle threats. Mm-hmm. And by the second volume, he was kind of losing the, the game, and the third is really shitty. But the, the first, first one was really yeah. good, really interesting, very different, and a lot of fun. I actually love the second one, too. So for me, my recommendation is the first two, I think, are super uh, solid. Well, I, I, don't think, I, don't think it's, it. I don't think it's spoiling anything to say the second volume is The War of the Worlds. Yeah, it has um, the... Prince of Mars, the guy, uh, John Carter of Mars. Yeah, John Carter of Mars and a couple of other Mars guys. Um, and it's it's more sci-fi than this one. This tends to be like a little bit supernatural, a little bit more down to earth. And the second one takes the league and is basically like, what if they came up against something so crazy that they probably aren't going to win? Yeah. And like, I really like that element of it. Like the first one, and like this was written a great right. Ride. Before Alan Moore really started to crawl up his own asshole. Yeah, I feel like this is some of the last. <laughs> Great stuff from Alan Moore. And especially the first one, I think, yeah. still stands as something that's really good. Yeah, yeah. I think it's boring. Yeah, Joe hates it, but... Yeah, I, Joe, I, actually, I, I have to thank Joe because I told him I wanted to recommend it, and he had two sets, a hardcover set and a softcover set of the first two uh-huh. volumes, and he gave me his hardcovers because he didn't want them. Yeah. I just, I also, call it the League of Extraordinarily Boring Gentlemen. <laughs> I like I'm not it. Gonna lie. <laughs> There's text pieces in here. It can be a little slower, and but there are people online who have done annotated guides of this, where every single panel is broken down, and they're like, "This character in the background is from this book, and this thing on the desk represents." And there's like, there's a crazy amount of detail that went into this book that it is kind of a masterwork for Alan Moore. I think yeah. he's still crazy. It still might not be your cup of tea, yeah. but there's a lot of love that went into these first couple books. There's now a big fat paperback that collects, I think, the first three volumes, if not just the does first it, two. Does it include Century? No, I think okay, it's just... I thought Century was the third volume. No, Black Dossier is the third volume. Uh, but isn't Black Dossier uh, all Black text? Black Dossier is no, all no, text. No, no, no it's, Black Dossier is not all yeah, text. Yeah, it's not all text. Not yeah, text. Yeah, okay. Okay. I, mean, I haven't read Black Dossier. Dossier. It's got James Bond it's, in it. It's, I thought okay. it was a majority text, and it was a follow-up to two. I thought that, that, that was my impression. Is majority text. No, Century is not. Century is basically those same characters being drawn throughout the 20th century. Yeah. And I'm going to spoil this because it's fucking garbage. The end of the third volume ends with them fighting a demonic Harry Potter. Uh, Who's the Antichrist? Yeah, it's fucking terrible. Yeah. 
Uh, Black Dossier is the one where it's in the 60s and they're running from... It's in the 50s, 60s, and they're running from James Bond. For okay, like I haven't read the Black book. Dossier. Yeah. It's, it's not that good. Not good. No, yeah. not good. I owned it for a long time because I was like, I, I, this will get better. And like, I bought Century 2. And but like it's Alan Ward. It. It yeah. I, I have copies of the first two volumes. I'm happy with that. Yeah. I don't want anything else. I think that the first two volumes are pretty decent. I still really like them. So what do so. you bring, Cade? Okay, well, I was uh, recently at the local comic shop, and I stumbled upon something I had never seen before, which is a little surprising since it came out in 2006 when I was still reading comics. Um, But this is called Pride of Baghdad by Brian K. Vaughn, with art by Nico Heinrichen. Heinrichen? Heinrichen, I think. Who who knows, really? (laughs) Um, It's it's German, so that's going to be a hard CH. We're very sorry. Um, and I haven't read it yet, so my pitch is not going to be the best. Um, but I, I think that the, the back of the book, um, sums it up pretty well. Um, it's, so this is inspired by a true story about some, uh, some lions that escaped from a zoo in Baghdad. During the bombing in, in 2003. Yeah. And so it says, in the spring of 2003, a pride of lions escaped from the Baghdad Zoo during an, um, an American bombing raid. Lost and confused, hungry but finally free, the four lions roamed the decimated streets of Baghdad in a desperate struggle for their lives. In documenting the, pride of the, the plight of the lions, Pride of Baghdad raises vital questions about the true meaning of freedom. Uh, I've read this one. I think it's really a, an interesting book for sure. Um, and the art in this book is, uh, that alone is worth a look. I feel the art in this book is beautiful. I think it's really, really, really well colored and is very interesting. So It's something I've meant to read for a long um, time. Yeah, Eric, you've read it too. I did. I read it right when it came out. Um, I really enjoyed it. I don't remember much about it. I remember I definitely enjoyed it though. I um, did the lions. If, if I'm wrong, I think the lions don't like have caption bubbles or talk in this book at no, all. No, they do. do. Oh, they do. Yeah, all the I animals talk. Full on okay. like Disney style. Oh, okay, yeah, I can't yeah. remember. But I, well, they're talking to these turtles. So yeah, all right. are they ninja turtles? They, uh, they might not. be. You never know with a turtle. Yeah, I'm they could. Yeah. They could always. Well, you never know ninjas. with ninjas. That's true too. That's true. The best way to be tell somebody's a ninja is to ask them, "Are you a ninja?" If they say no. Probably a ninja. Yeah, and also probably a turtle. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way to know for sure. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's definitely worth a look. Brian Kavon, I think, was at kind of the height of his game when he was writing this. Why the Last Man was probably in like maybe the third volume, fourth volume. Yeah, it was still going. It was like early. Yeah, it was still ongoing at man. the time. Because yeah. so, I, I feel like this was out right when I started to read me Why too. the Last Man, yeah. which was probably around the like the late twenties. Yeah, I think it was like volume four, maybe Something. when I read this, which was in the library. Marlo, check out your local library to be, read great trades because that's where I read this, and all of Why the Last Man was in the library. So yeah, definitely worth checking out. You actually just reminded me that uh, our local library now has an app that I totally meant to download and install. Ooh, so I'm going to do that right now. All right, um, I brought uh, Conan. Queen of the Black Coast, which is nice. actually volume 13 of Conan, uh, the, Dark the Dark Horse, Horse stuff. Conan. This is written by Brian Wood, who's an uh, our artist we, or author we've talked about quite a bit on this one. Um, it's hard for... I've always wanted to pitch a Conan book on this show, but it's hard for me to pick a great one to start with because the Dark Horse stuff is kind of one continuous story. There are stories that are better than others to just jump into. I think actually the very first trade of Conan is a little bit dense to get into. The art's very painted. It feels very slow. And so I think that it doesn't really pick up its speed until a little bit later. But that first book is really good. I think this whole series is worth reading. I was buying that when it was coming out, and it is really good. Yeah, I just... It's Conan, you know, it's Conan. <laughs> well, and even though this is trade volume 13, yeah. it is a new, like, comic-wise, well, it was the start with the new number one. Right. As far as being Conan, the book. But Marine, yeah. each trade kind of is its own self-contained story. Like, yeah. the trade, the formula for the trades on these are Conan wanders into place X, a uh, problem Y arises, Conan, you know, heavy-fistedly gets through the problem by basically beating everyone up and being Conan, 
And then in the end, the problem is sometimes resolved. Like that's kind <laughs> of the, the formula for these trades. And they're great action stories. The art is usually really, really fun in these. It's an amazing setting. If you've never read any of the Conan stories, they just put a huge omnibus oh issue. It's, it's so, so big you cannot read it. It's what heavy. Of the comics? Of the it's, comics. It's, it's zero through 50 of that initial I, Conan run I have that Dark Horse did. I have an yeah. abiding love in my heart so, for the old 70s Conan, the Roy yeah. Thomas stuff. And those are amazing. And they're great, but... The the newer stuff because it was being written by Mark Wade initially, wasn't it? Um, it was Kurt Busiek. Kurt Busiek. Yeah. I always and get then the, Tim I, Truman took over. Right. Always screw up their names in my head. But in any case, like yeah. that new comic is really really good. Well, it's a lot of the same stories that were in the older stuff, which Dark Horse is now reprinting. So it's Conan Chronicles Classic of, Chronicles, Chronicles, Chronicles of Conan collections of the Marvel, which yeah. is uh, is great stuff to read. But if you're looking for something a little bit more modern, these Absolutely. are these are a little bit easier to read. But I recommend reading both. They're so good. Well, if you're a fan of Conan, yeah. I think that you'll enjoy both. Yeah, and Conan is such a rich setting. Um, it's it's so. Fun to see Conan go through these adventures. Great adventure stories. Great fantasy stories. There aren't enough fantasy comics out there. I wanted to recommend that at some point. This one, Queen of the Black Coast, the story opens. Basically, Conan's running away from some guards because he got into a bar fight with them the night before. Typical Conan. He's <laughs> he's escaped from prison and he's running. And he jumps onto a pirate ship and basically is like, Okay, I'm a pirate now. I'm part of your crew because I don't want to be contained by those guards and I that's, got away. That's how Conan that's, works. That's kind of how Conan rolls. So it's a great like pirate story. There's a, gr- a lot of great, su- what I would call supernatural elements, but I guess just like fantasy elements in this story with... Sword and sorcery. Yeah, great stuff. Like if you liked Fafford and the Grey Mouser that we read, that's how you say that right? Fa- yeah. Fafford? Fafford. Fafford. I can never say that right. So <laughs> yeah. if you like Fafford... I would Fafford, say that wrong too. Yeah, you know? if you like Fafford and the Grey Mouser and you're looking for more like great rough and tumble kind of sword and sorcery stuff that inspired early Dungeons and Dragons. I definitely think Conan is worth a read. I think this book is really fun. It's a great jumping on point. Queen of the Black Coast. Check it out. Check out all of the Dark Horse stuff and Chronicles of Conan if you like Conan. But I wanted to get a fantasy wreck in there. Nice. I haven't had one in a while. Good job. Definitely. All right, Joe, what are you voting for? Uh... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm looking around for Battling Boy. Right. Yeah. Eric, what do you want? Uh, I don't know if you guys saw my post, but I actually found a, an old 80s Conan for a quarter at the Half Price Books the Ooh, other day. And it was one of the, the first comics I ever read for Conan back in 85, 86. So that would, would have been later Marvel comics stuff, not the Roy Thomas stuff. But uh, I read it, and it, it was actually shockingly really good because um, I've read a ton of the Dark Horse stuff. Yeah. So I want to read Conan because I'm in a Conan phase right Sweet. now, basically. So I yeah, that want, sounds great. I need more. All right. Uh, I'm going to vote for Scud, the Disposable Assassin. Ooh. Okay, what you got? I'm also going to vote for Scud, the Disposable Assassin. Wow. That's that's actually what I was going to vote for, too. So three votes for Scud, Joe. Awesome. Um, yeah, and if you love Conan, one other shout-out is to um, Derek Robertson, who we've talked a lot about. Oh, yes, show. wrote a great... He has a fantastic one-shot single-issue oh, comic really good. that is so good. Uh, it's such a great kind of introduction to why Conan as a character yeah. is really interesting. It's, so it's super If you've exciting. never read Conan and you want to check some out, I would recommend that issue for sure. And uh, like every week, read all the books. Definitely check these all out. They're very fun. Yep. And for next time, we will be reading Scud the Disposable Assassin. Finally! Yay! Uh, thanks for listening, guys. And uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.